Picture this, two guys trapped in the South Charleston Public Library. One guy loves movies, the other, well, he'd rather be watching reality TV. Can they survive each other's films? Find out on Real Opposites, a library podcast about movies. Hosted by Josh and Aaron from the South Charleston Public Library. Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Real Opposites. I'm Aaron. And I'm Josh. This week, we're back for our Thanksgiving episode. Uh, we both chose movies for each other. You went like a traditional Thanksgiving route. The best Thanksgiving film ever made, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Yeah. And I went with, it's not a Thanksgiving movie, but it makes me think of my Thanksgivings growing up. It sure feels like a Thanksgiving movie. Yeah, it does. Uh, and that was just August Osage County. So we're going to discuss those. I think we are going to start with August Osage County. I believe so. Okay. It's the heavier of the two. That is true. It is heavy. So, looking at the back of the DVD, it says Academy Award winners Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts star in this darkly hilarious and deeply touching story of the strong-willed women of the Weston family, whose lives converge when a family crisis brings them back to the Midwest home they grew up in and to the dysfunctional mother who raised them. And I didn't know this, but it's based on uh, Tracy Letts Pulitzer Prize winning play of the same name. Oh, actually, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tracy Letts is awesome. Yeah. So I'd like to see that play. It has a pretty good cast to it. So I did. I thought. I, see, I didn't know that he, that this was based on one of his plays. He uh, wrote the plays and kind of helped William Friedkin in creating the two films based on his plays, Bug with Ashley Judd and Michael Shannon and Killer Joe with Matthew McConaughey and... Um, Juno Temple. Oh, okay. Uh, and both of those are really great films. So uh, his his plays must be pretty pretty good for them to translate to movies so often. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I mean those two especially are really well yeah. really well written. Yeah. Killer Joe especially. That's a fantastic film. Hmm. I might have to check those out. But as far as August Osage County, I I watched it when I was well, I think when it came out. Mm-hmm. Um and I just remember loving it and I don't know, in a way, being able to relate to the family, n- not specifically on the issues, but just in general. Yeah. And I don't know, when I think of Thanksgiving, this is what I think of. Like, that's that's how my Thanksgivings were. Uh, you never know what's going to happen, who's going to be in a fight for what reason, or what the skeletons will... that will get dragged yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my version of Thanksgiving. So that's why I picked this movie on our Thanksgiving episode. But I just remember really liking it. I hadn't seen it since it was out, so this was my first time rewatching it. Um, it's been about 10 years. I think it's, what, 2013? Yeah, I think so. So what did you end up thinking? Uh, so there's like a similar film called Home for the Holidays, like mm-hmm. a more comedic take on it with Holly Hunter. Okay. I don't know who it came out in like 95, I think. Okay. Uh, but it's like, it's a Thanksgiving film. There's a lot of arguing. Oh, okay. Of anyway. Um, so August Osage, I love Tracy. Like now I kind of feel bad that I didn't really like it because I like <laughs> Tracy lets other films based on his plays. Yeah. Um, it just, it just feels like I've been there and done that, done this movie, like, you know, family get together, whatever it is, funeral or yeah, wedding or whatever. Um, skeletons are in the closet or come out. Um, there's arguments, there's makeups, breakups, whatever. You know, right. it's just like, I don't know. And none of it really grabbed me. I mean, everyone in the film is like very talented mm-hmm. actor and actresses. And it's like not that it's not well written. It's, it just, it doesn't really do anything for me. It, I think I think a lot of it is the direction lets it down. Yeah. I don't think there's anything particularly special about what John Wales, the director, does mm-hmm. with... The script. I mean, I wanted to murder Meryl Streep. Yeah. Because <laughs> she just, she reminds me of someone. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, I mean, I think you're supposed to feel like she's just, I mean, she's pretty uh, un, um, ir- irredeemable. Yeah. Like, she's just a pretty terrible person. Right. 
through and through. Like there's no, and I appreciate it that there's not, they're not trying to sugarcoat. Like there's yeah. not some like big makeup at the end between anybody. Like it's just, I think, I mean, in that, in that respect, it's very, I feel like it's a very honest film. Like, right. That's where I think the Tracy lights come through. I think the script and what it's, you know, how it's structured and everything is, is very solid. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't really feel it's very cinematic. Like you can still make a play. Like the the two I talked about, Bug and Killer Joe, especially Bug, because it mostly takes place in this one hotel room. Mm-hmm. Um, but it still is very cinematic, and you feel like there's the hotel room is bigger than what it actually is. And but this mostly takes place at this you know ranch house or yeah. plantation home or whatever, um, and. It just feels very blah, blah, like just bland. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot done to bring, to like bring me in very much. Like it's yeah. just, and some of the, I mean, some of the stuff's just really obvious, like what happens and like, mm-hmm. you know, um, I'm amazed he didn't do it earlier. Like Sam Shepard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being married to her. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I mean, yeah. I mean, the cast is great. I just think that's kind of wasted on just mediocre, yeah, filmmaking. Well, that stinks. I was hoping you'd like it, but I think I think for me, I, which I, so I this was only my second time seeing it, and I absolutely loved it again. I think for me, some of it is the it's rawness in the way that it's kind of truthful there's not a big makeup at the end there's not no. like no everything's not turning out nice for everybody like everything turns out pretty bad yeah i mean especially well first of all she was trying to date her cousin anyways <laughs> but yeah, to find out it's her brother is <laughs> was pretty big mm-hmm. but I, I think i like that there were it wasn't just small petty stuff that was coming out. It was actual like issues, oh. and they dealt with some some realistic ones like the pills uh, mm-hmm. from Meryl Streep's character, yeah, and things like that. Um, this this movie probably is a good example of the kind of drama comedy I like. Because the comedy, which I do think there's there's comedy in this, there is some, but yeah. it's. It's like dark comedy. It, it's it's not like in your face. No, no, no. It's not slapstick kind of or anything. Thing. It's... Yeah, it is kind of a deeper comedy that's that's based in drama, and I and I like that. I mean, it does mostly. It comes out of the characters, right? It comes out of their reactions to things, right? That's that's what I'm saying. It's not it's not like they're setting up for jokes, kind of. Thing. No, um, and I like that in a in a movie, but. The kind of drama that this is, or that's what I would call it. Uh, I don't know. I like that. I like that. Well, Honestly, I love dysfunctional. We've talked about it before. Yeah, well, I, I mean, love dysfunctional like, family. Like Squid and the whale is yeah. what I was thinking of when I'm watching this one. Is like, yeah. well, this is have kind of s- up that same alley. Another Dermot Maroney Christmas movie. Uh, have you seen The Family Stone? I don't know if I have. I feel or not. like you would Sarah like Jessica that Parker. one based on. I think so. It, it is based on your love for this. I think yeah. you would like that one too. It's another like dysfunctional family holiday movie. Yeah. Um. Sorry. Good. But I do. I like dysfunctional family movies, and I don't know. This one's done. I feel like a lot of them are done with more of a comedy outlook on it, and especially when you get into like Christmas ones, mm-hmm. but. I like this one because it's it's rooted around somebody missing and then a funeral and it's just kind of more dark, I think, yeah. a little bit. Um No, I mean I appreciate some of the like dark humor. Mm-hmm. Even though it's pretty sparse. Like I don't really remember. Yeah, like, it's it's of, not tons. Um it's more just like some reaction lines to certain things. Right. I feel like just the the filmmaking and the camera work didn't really change throughout any of the film based on what was happening. Everything just seemed very flat. Like when somebody has a big blow up, it's not really, the the camera isn't reacting. 
is right. it changing style? It's like typically, like you know, like you can have a steady scene and it's just two people talking. And it's just locked off cameras, but then someone gets up and they're angry and they're screaming or something, and the camera will get a little shaky. And that's just to just subconsciously let you know things are getting real. Things are right. off kilter, or you know, um, I didn't really feel any of that in the film. I mean, not that you have to do that. It's just I see your I point. Mean, you though. can just lock off the camera and it's fine. Yeah. Like I mean, like the, like. It's fine. Like it, it gets the job done, but it's not really right. And um, I think I think you're right in that sense. It doesn't have those kind of shots. And I do think those kind of shots, especially with the talent that's in this movie, mm-hmm. like paired with some of those kind of shots, I think it would be a better movie. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, I'd also like to mention that I would like to never listen to Ewan McGregor or Benedict Cumberbatch attempt uh, English accents. Or American accents. Anyway. <laughs> Both of them are not good at it, and they should yeah. just stop. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I love Ewan McGregor. Like, he's great. Yeah. He's a great actor. And, like, when he's able to just use his Regular. voice, um, then yeah. Cumberbatch is great. But when he, when I don't know, it's something about both of them when they try to do an English, American accent, mm-hmm. it just it feels like a, an AI is oh the yeah AI voice yeah and he like you and McGregor in particular like over pronounces everything like everything is there's no like rhythm yeah yeah to his uh, I mean he's a great actor they're both great actors I'm just I was a little, I was a little <laughs> as I was thinking I was like damn he's doing another American accent right <laughs> um I can't remember does he do a does um Bendit Cumberbatch do an American accent for Stephen Strange. Yeah, yeah, it's American. Yeah, I was like, I don't feel like it was as jar. It's not as jarring as it's not as bad strange. as you and McGregor's. It, well, no, I just mean it. Like, I think he's gotten better. In the maybe because like, I mean this was a, an early American film for him. Yeah, um, uh-huh. I think before this he'd done like Sherlock. Yeah, right. And yeah, twenty thirteen Sherlock. I think this is, or maybe it's around the time Imitation Game. Mm-hmm. But he's not American. No, he's right. So, not. Um, but this might have been like one of the first times he did an American accent. No. And it's not as bad as Ewan McGregor's, but Ewan McGregor should know better by now. Like he's right. like, like go to a voice coach and figure this you, stuff you out. You should just know that you can't do this at yeah. this point. Yeah. In your and it's okay. Like you just like, <laughs> like I mean, there's nothing saying that that he can't be British either. No. Right. Like he can't just because he's the husband. He's not really he's not blood. Ewan. Right. Ewan McGregor. Yeah. yeah. Um Yeah, that's true. So he, he could, could have just been be British. British. And I would just be less um Less distracting <laughs> from yeah. from the rest of the film, uh, but yeah, I mean, everyone in the movie's great. Yeah, I, I I especially like I've always liked Chris Cooper a lot. Um, he plays Charles Charlie, the older dad, the dad oh, of yeah. uh, the dad, little Charles. Yeah, um, I like him a lot, and I mean, Meryl Streep's like I don't know any any anymore. I just see Meryl Streep, and I'm just like, just trying for another Oscar, aren't you? Yeah, you know, I don't, I, I don't know her. I get that. Kind of boring. I do like, like her, but she well, was, this uh, is older though. I mean, it's still like ten years. Like it's yeah. not that old. But um, I, I mean, I like her in this. But I really love Ju- uh, Julia Roberts in this one. Mm-hmm. No, she's good. I, I thought um, she was great at her character. I like. I generally like her when she's doing more dramatic roles. Yeah. Um, I what? think she won an Oscar for Aaron Brockovich. She's yes. really good in that. Yeah. Great movie. I haven't seen her in anything in a while. Uh, there for a while, which I haven't seen them, but there for a while she was doing a lot of independent stuff. Yeah. And kind of She like, was on this show low budget Ga- stuff. Gaslight, Gaslight, I think. Yeah. Which I haven't watched. But yeah, I always, I mean, I don't know. She was always okay. Yeah. I've like always been a fan of she's good Julia this. Roberts. And I like Sam Shepard, even though he's barely in the movie. I like yeah. the opening with him. It is you know? good. It's yeah. and there was a little bit of humor in that part. Yeah, in um, hiring the lady. Yeah, which that see, and that's another thing. I mean, because at first, when Meryl Streep would talk about the lady they hired, uh, mm-hmm. jo- Jonna, Jonah. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, man, this is not PC. Like, I cannot. Well, no. She's but then not. it turns out that that that's part of the plot, and. You know, it well, it's okay for characters to be racist, right? I mean, because people are, yeah, and, and that that's and what like I was saying. The, like, at first, watching it, 
I forgot that that's like a the plot line, yeah. and I was like, oh man, this doesn't age well. Yeah. But then it got to it, and I was like, oh man, this does feel like Thanksgiving. Yeah. I, I almost think like someone else in that role would have been a better choice because Meryl yeah. Streep brings a lot of baggage to it, and it's just like there's there's no real redeeming qualities to her, and I feel like someone less like um identifiable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would be a better choice because she like okay it's Meryl Streep she's gonna be a bitch throughout the whole movie and okay here we go yeah um whereas I think someone else would have been more surprising like if you had taken a more comedic actress yeah. right put her uh in that role I would I think like it would have been, been good to see Meryl Streep play a nice lady <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like Margaret Thatcher <laughs> and this and like yeah, it's like, like even you just play like a normal person like you, you used to do that yeah she used to do that more often mm -hmm. even uh, in like Mamma Mia like is she plays complex characters often but like playing like the withholding cold woman like even in like Mamma Mia which is a different like mm -hmm. it's she still has like that quality of like yeah oh you're an adult that doesn't really know how to treat people yeah yeah this is where we're at like i don't know it's yeah. I, I, like i'm not sure why she only gets those roles but because well, those like are like the showy things showy yeah. roles that right. get her oscar nominations right exactly yeah. i mean i do like her and i like her in this film but i see where you're you're saying it it would have been more shocking mm -hmm. yeah i mean just have someone else who you wouldn't suspect yeah um, that's what i think some of the choices are very obvious Mm -hmm. Um, just in the filmmaking and in the casting choices, right? But it is a really good cast. I mean, you could do anything with this cast. Yeah. The original, uh, I was reading that the original casting for Meryl Streep's role, um, was suggested. Uh, Dame Judi Dench was suggested, Ugh, God. and it's like that's the same no. thing. <laughs> no, <laughs> like... you don't do that. <laughs> and um, the director insisted on American actors for the two. Uh, main those. roles, but um, it was Dame Judi Dench and I would have liked to seen someone like Diane Lane. Yeah, no, she's someone a else. she can do comedy and she can do drama, yeah. but she's generally like she's not an a hole in every movie. Yeah, so I feel like that would have been someone like that would have been more like, oh wow, I'm not I wasn't expecting her to be this much of a you know piece of work. Yeah. Um, right out of the gate. The other recommended person was Nicole Kidman for Barbara, and it no. said the no. writer was like, "No, like it needs to be American Nicole Kidman for Barbara," no. and she was like, "No, it needs to be American actors for these two roles, basically." Why? Why that one, but not? Um, why that <laughs> one? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, the um, the playwright Tracy, mm -hmm. he did. He was against them hiring yeah. um, British actors. Yes, he he yeah. voiced that they yeah. shouldn't. Okay. Um, well, he, it says on here that he changed is, his mind once he saw it, but yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. if his first inclination is I don't want I want American actors in this because there is an authenticity to like this is a deep like it's rooted deep in rooted, middle yeah. America, right? And well, and Benedict, I mean, you, you see like Benedict when he pops in the movie and he drops off that bus, and it's just like no. I don't buy it immediately. I'm just like, you're not See, American. See, I didn't either. Well, he like, just looks British. Yeah. yeah. And like, I didn't buy it. The, no. Like, when they when he, when he they dropped him off, I was like, well, who's this going to be? Yeah. yeah. Like, when I rewatched it, I, I noticed that, too. It was, he just seemed out of place. Yeah. The, there's, like, a well, cultural difference. All, like, I, yes, I think that there is some of, well, like, there are British people that can play Americans super well and Americans that can play British well. Yeah. In terms of the accent and stuff, there is a difference in cultural behavior and the, mm -hmm. like, way that I think even down to the way that people, like, kind of carry themselves feels different. Yeah, it does. This side you can of just the kinda ocean. Feel it. Yeah. Um, also, Meryl, like, the Meryl Streep, she kind of, for some reason, I was a little confused at the start because I was like, wait, is she like a, a Southern mother, mom? Because feel, she feels like something like this would be set in Georgia. Right. And I'm like, oh, no, no, wait, this is in, oh, I forget where, the Midwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, because she just has that like, uh, like everything, everything she says has a little tinge of like, guilt or right passive aggressiveness somewhere in there even even when she's complimentary mm -hmm. oh. um 
which I know Toby. That feels speak familiar. To. Um, <laughs> but I mean, she, I, I feel like that's a very Southern thing. Yeah, yes. it is. And it just was like, I was a little like, wait, confused. Like, she just feels like Southern. Yeah, I kind of forgot I guess about that's, that's a universal. Yeah. Thing. I kind of forgot it was out West, Midwest. Um, because of that, it does, it does come across very Southern, a yeah. Southern family. Yeah, the whole thing does. Kind of thing. Um, Even like just a big country house kind of feels like it should be right. near a swamp in the. Yeah, I'm not from the Midwest. I don't know how their how their what their skills of passive aggression are like, but right. it does fe- that does feel that did southern. feel southern. Yeah, um, just kind of the yes, like the tinge of not really being nice ever. Right, like not fully. It's all backhanded. Is is weird, especially yeah. like coming from like a mom because it feels like it comes from a place of like. There's a part of it that's like I just want better for my kids, mm-hmm. but it's also like you don't you don't have to right like, you don't you don't have to say that or you don't have to think that while you're saying not that yeah but I know that that's what like yeah she definitely had a lot of that like kind of uh, I don't know I guess like it it's a waspy thing Passive too aggressive yeah um, so, so I was reading Sissy Spacek was originally considered for Violet mm hmm. That would have been perfect. Is that the mom? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been good. Because you, because she's kind of meek. Yeah. And I could have timid. seen that. And then if you see her just like have an outburst or just yeah be nasty, it's like you don't expect it, and it's like yeah. shocking. That would I could I could see that working for sure. Would, I bet you that was probably Tracy Letts' first know choice. Yeah. Who does that real well? Have you guys seen the bear yet? Mm hmm. Oh, the show. Uh huh. No. Oh my God! Why is her name slipping my I mind? I saw Cocaine Bear. Um, that's not. <laughs> yeah, I did but too. the show <laughs> you would especially love the show. I've heard. Of um, she's the like. Oh no, she's the main girl in Halloween. Why is it gone? Jamie Lee Curtis. Yes, Jamie Lee Curtis plays a super venomy, crazy mom. Okay. In the Bear, and it is awesome. I can like, see her doing that. She yeah. goes from yeah. like. Very, like, you know, you're happy, like, upbeat, like, mom at the holidays to, like, mm. losing her mind, like, yeah, quick. Yeah. And it's it's really, really good. Yeah, I could see her. I could this. see her doing yeah, I think so this kind of role. But she's traditionally comedic. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, yeah, I aside from all the horror movies, she right. was mostly well, in the then. 80s and 90s was, yeah. you know, yeah. Fish Called Wanda, True Lies, all those, you know. She's Freaky been- Friday. She's been campaigning yeah. for a role in the uh, One Piece live action, and I'm I'm about it. She's she's been she's really trying. And yeah. they, Netflix would be dumb not to give it to her, <laughs> but I feel like. Uh, but yeah, sorry. I was just thinking about like this character and then her character that I was like that would. She could have worked for that. Also, yeah. I um. Yeah, I think Sissy Spacek could have been good. I think for me, like I said, this movie just, I don't know, something about it feels very relatable for me. And I think it's just because it does touch on a lot of different topics Mm -hmm. um, of the kind of stuff that, (laughs) I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know, maybe my family's different, but it's like, I can relate to most of these characters and I can see people I know as these characters and... It just, that's why when we, when we started talking about a Thanksgiving episode, this is the first thing that came to my mind. Okay. Um, was that, and maybe that's why I enjoy it is because I do feel related, relatable, I guess, to that family or that family feels relatable. Uh, but I mean, also there's just a lot of people in there that I like yeah. and I think they do a good job for the most part. Is I don't your... think it's really the acting that fails. No, no, no. I don't think anybody. So, that's nice. I mean, Meryl Streep, for all my issues with her performances, is, it's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also, does your family listen to this podcast? Um, this is going to be a fun Thanksgiving. Probably not. Who are you talking about on that podcast? <laughs> <laughs> are you referring to me? Who am I in this movie? No, I, I go seriously movie doubt now. any of my family listens to this. <laughs> and even if they do, I think... It's not like my family that I'm going to see on Thanksgiving this year. So. Oh, okay. So it's okay. So okay. it's a but distant family. <laughs> that's as soon as I as soon as I picked this movie and I was talking to one of my friends, um, and I said, Okay, I picked this movie and I gotta talk about it and I wanna talk about how relatable it is, but 
I know I have to like wind down what I really want to say. <laughs> I was like, this might be a tough episode Just say for it. me. Like, airing the family's dirty laundry yeah. out on the. No, I'm saving that for a book one day. The, the podcast. <laughs> Sorry, or, 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 or your podcast, the Air and yeah, Only podcast. That's true. No, yeah, maybe. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, families can be a lot. And there's, I think, coming together for any kind of situation, there's always that tension. Okay, I don't know about all families, but my... Uh, my personal experience, families, there's a tension there, and there's always something going on behind the scenes, yeah. for sure. Um, and some on? skeletons and, you know, secrets that we keep from our family and having to hide them. And I don't know. So, but that's, I think that's why it was so relatable to me. Uh, and I just, I don't know. It's one of those movies. I'm saying I don't know a lot. Uh, <laughs> but it's one of those movies I just... I can put on and actually watch. Okay. I, like, it carries me through. It's enough drama, enough dark humor mm -hmm. that I was easy. it was easy for me to sit down and watch beginning to end. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So that's August Osage County, I guess. Mm -hmm. You did not like it. I mean, it was just kind of, it's kind of middle of the road. Yeah. I didn't hate it. Well, I'm glad um, you didn't hate it. No, I mean, it's still like a competent film. Right. It's just not, uh, there's just stylistic choices I think it could have used and some yeah. different casting. Uh, but, I, I mean, it's perfectly serviceable. Yeah. And talking about those with you, like, I agree. I, I love Meryl Streep and I love her in this, but I could see a different type of casting. Yeah. Really having it stand out more there's just something about i don't buy it uh, any like when anytime i see her a lot anymore. Yeah. it's just i don't <laughs> all i see is meryl streep and all i see is another oscar nomination i don't right. see a performance it just feels i mean it's fake it's a movie but it feels right. more fake than it should yeah but and i and I'd also see where some stylistic type shots would have been would have been good yeah so even some wide, more wide frame, I think, where you see the whole, all the action going on at yeah. once. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of mediums, but just yeah. like the camera being more intuitive right. to what's mm -hmm. going on in the scene or like right. in the middle of the scene, something happens in the scene. Um, yeah, I agree. But, you know, it's all right. Yeah. Okay. And of course, I loved it. It's I mean, not, I didn't. It's not Coyote Ugly. So. Yeah, that's good. Or, uh, God, what was the last one? Tammy. No, what was the last one? Oh, last episode. Truth or Dare? Truth or Dare. Truth or Dare. It's not Truth or Dare. That one might be the worst. I feel like Tammy was the worst, just yeah, based I mean, on like the- I absolutely love Tammy. Well, Truth or Dare was the worst horror film. I uh, just, Tammy is the worst just film. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like you, you're you still using Coyote Ugly as your bottom benchmark, I know, but, but we I definitely like said in the Coyote Tammy Ugly. episode yeah. that it unseated Coyote Ugly Well, I think Ugly Coyote Ugly is a good one to use because that was one I was surprised by <laughs> how much he hated it. Because I've Ugly. always thought it was a good movie. <laughs> but so I think Coyote Ugly is still a good benchmark. But okay, well. Well, I, Coyote Ugly is like a, that's you. Right. Very you, yeah. True. I don't mean that. I don't mean that to be like. No, I, I no, I get what you're saying. Like, I don't mean that. To I be agree. Personal. I'm no, I agree. Uh, and I think that's why I'm so like attached to that movie, and that's why I was surprised you hated it so much. Yeah. But so it makes a good benchmark for sure. Okay. So I guess that's August Osage County, and we're gonna take a break and have some announcements from the library and then we'll come back and we'll discuss your movie we're gonna go have some pumpkin pie planes trains and automobiles there's some pumpkin pumpkin pie, pie. where's our pumpkin pie all right so we're back from those messages and turns out there was not actual pumpkin pie we were gonna have it was just a figure of speech and I was really sad about that <laughs> I thought I thought maybe one of you had got a message that somebody brought us some pumpkin pie here or something no. And I really thought we were going to eat pumpkin pie, Aaron. which would have been perfect. But well, anyways, but we're back. Makes me very happy that I was able to disappoint you that much. <laughs> <laughs> it was very disappointing. I'm even more of a pecan pie person, but mm. I don't know. I haven't yeah. had pumpkin pie this year I'm yet. Not a big so. pumpkin pie. What is, what is, not, what's, but I guess pecan I like pie it. is your holiday favorite pie. Yes. What's your favorite holiday? Apple. 
apple. Yeah, it's okay. It's good. Like a really good homemade apple. Pie. Oh yeah, I mean they're good. Oh. Okay. Anyway. Well, anyway. I related. I guess we're back from those. Well, we already said that. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Um, that's we're already back. been announced. Yes. <laughs> We've been back. We've been back. <laughs> We've been back. <laughs> Money in. So we're going to talk about planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. So I picked this because it's the best holiday film. I don't even care which one, which holiday. It's the best holiday film ever. I watch it every year. Um, I didn't even watch it for this podcast because oh. I I watch it every year. Yeah, it has a lot of nostalgia for me. But anyway, okay, so I'm gonna read the back of the DVD box real quick. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Neil Page is an advertising executive who just wants to fly home to get to Chicago to spend Thanksgiving with his family, but all Neil Page gets is misery, misery, named Dell. Griffith, a loud mouth but nevertheless lovable salesman who leads Neil on a cross-country wild goose chase that keeps Neil from tasting his turkey. Steve Martin and John Candy are absolutely wonderful as two guys with a knack for making the worst of a bad situation. If it's painful, funny, or just plain crazy, it happens to Neil and Dale in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, every traveler's nightmare in a comedy come true. So Planes, Trains, and Automobiles... So this was written and directed by John Hughes, who would famously come up with like an idea, a random idea, and then write a script, and he'd have it in five days or a week, Yeah, which is what happened here. I think it's the best John Hughes film by far. I mean, he's mostly known for the teen films, like Breakfast Club, uh-huh. 16 Candles, Pretty in Pink. Um, and those are good. Yeah. Um, I like some kind of wonderful the most, though, of his teen movies, just the lesser... Like it's not as popular or iconic as yeah the other ones. Um, but I think this one, it's the most sincere. It's the funniest. It really has the best situational comedy. Mm-hmm. As two actors, a- absolutely just at the top of their game. Like, and they're willing to play. Like, if you really got stuck with Del Griffith or. Neil Page. Right. You would react in a lot of the same like there's there's a truth to what he how he writes in this film. Yeah. Whereas I think some of the there's a truth to a lot of his other stuff, but it's it's more subtle. No, I mean it's just more I know it's more broad. Yeah. This. I mean okay. this not that this is like a subtle film, but like there's subtleties to the to the inflections to the way they talk to their interactions. Right. And the movie goes from just being like this, it could have been, and I'm sure whatever, if they do end up remaking this, what it'll end up being is just some cynical, over the top, you know, comedy, quote unquote, that just puts them in preposterous situations. Right. Um, Is that a plan to remake it? There's been plans over the years. I think the last one was like um, Will Smith and Kevin Hart or something. Hmm. I don't know. I'm just like, just don't touch it. it yeah. To me, this is this is the Wizard of Oz, or you know, I doubt Will Smith and Kevin Hart's going to be in a movie together. I don't. I mean, I after, don't know. It was somebody. I mean, now because you know he slapped him. That, no, that's that's that Chris wasn't Rock. Kevin Hart. That was Chris. That's Rock. Chris Rock. Kevin Hart's the little one. That's Kevin Hart's the, the little the guy. Rock with everything. Yeah, he's in the Rock. Like the rock. he's in, he was in Jumanji. No, I know who he is, but I thought that's who he slapped. No, he slapped Chris Rock. Mm-hmm. Much more talented comedian. Oh, <laughs> but just use that little just to I'll smack <laughs> Kevin Hart my words. <laughs> try better, <laughs> try more, whatever. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, so like the situations they that Pews puts them in are identify like you can relate to a flight not you know being like like you having to land in a place you're not supposed to be going because of weather or a train break train breaking down or just it's just circumstances that they find themselves in they yeah. get a little bit ridiculous when the car's on fire and they end up somehow being able to drive it right but it's just a great funny visual of a smoking car and them driving it wrapped up in all their winter gear right um and then you know there's there's an emotional truth to why this is what I what what the movie does so well. Del Griffith in a lesser film would just be the, he would be Melissa McCarthy. 
right in Tammy. There would be no redeeming qualities. He would just be a annoying twerp that you just don't want to see ever. Just how I felt about Tammy. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a reality to the why he is the way he is that comes out at the end of the movie when you realize that his wife's been dead and right. he's just searching for anyone, any kind of human connection. Human connection. Yeah. And that ending every single time gets me. I'm about like, getting emotional just thinking about it. Just the way you know, the, the song song drops. Yeah. They're walking, carrying his 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 uh, luggage, and it, you know just the way it, it stops on his smile. It's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. it's perfect film. I would not change a single frame about the movie. There's supposedly a like a two and a half hour cut or something of this. Like, there's a lot of stuff cut out of the film. Yeah, and thankfully they. How long was this film? I mean, it's only like 90, oh, okay. 92 minutes now. But I mean, at some point, there was like an extra 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah. Because there was like a subplot where um, his wife thinks he's cheating. He's cheating on her because he's not calling and he's not doing this. And like, why are you here? Why are you there? And he's can't. I think they briefly touch on it a it little kind bit of, still. I mean, it's. Or it kind of alludes to that. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. And I think I think that was much smarter because just keep the focus on. On their journey. Yeah. You know, don't get sidetracked by subplots, uh, which they do a lot now in comedies. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't need a million. You just need a simple premise. Just execute right. it well. I don't need a million different plot lines to go all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a perfect film. It's my probably my favorite comedy of all time. So, no pressure, but what'd you think? <laughs> well, <laughs> first of all, I love John Candy and Steve Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they make a great pair. I thought the movie was... Was a cute little movie. I, I mean, I liked it. I I just don't think it made me laugh as much as I thought it would. Okay. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of like actual laughing moments. There were parts that made me like smile a little bit or something like that. But I think that was more of a personal thing because I think as things just got worse and worse, I just felt like really bad for them <laughs> yeah. like not like but not in a funny way for some reason okay. i just felt bad like it just kept happening and i was like oh like this is just horrible i'm watching somebody's life be ruined um kind of feeling which is not what i expected yeah but i mean overall i, I was able to sit down and watch the movie all the way through i think it's a good movie i think like i said it is funny it just wasn't a whole lot of laugh out loud type moments. And I expected to kind of laugh a lot and be like one of those movies where like my face is hurting because I was laughing so much. Okay. Um, because like I said, I think Steve Martin and um, John Candy, John Candy are both great and I, I find them both hilarious. But yeah, I mean, other than, other than not laughing out loud as much as I thought, I liked the movie. It was good. It's a good little, Holiday movie. It's family friendly, which is good. Except for one scene. Except for one scene. Where they say the F word 19 times. Where he's like, and you lost, oh, my, yeah. you lost oh, yeah. my effing keys and the effing car and the yeah, effing that's parking true. lot. You left me in effing nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe not exactly family friendly. Like the, aside from that one scene, it's like a PG movie. Yeah. But I but, love that they kept that scene in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, we're going to go R. It would have been rated PG or PG 13 if it weren't for that yeah. one scene. Yeah. And see. Which I remember, like when I was like in school, and like I was, I was like, "We're watching a movie in school today." They're like, "You should take planes, trains, and automobiles." And I'm like, "No, mom." Yeah, <laughs> can't do that. He just has that one scene. <laughs> There's that one scene. And I think Steve Martin does really well at kind of what you were talking about with Meryl Streep in the other film. Yeah. Is his character? You don't expect it. It's more shocking when he does something. Yeah. When when outrageous he, when he berates Dell. Yeah. Like in the, the, ah, 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 you know. Oh, yeah. That was, I mean, it's like he is, he it was is rough. insufferable. He yeah. is an a hole of the yeah. highest order. Mm -hmm. uh, Which he's been through a lot. So, he I mean, has, I, get it, I mean, I get but, the, but, uh, yeah, but like, it is you get shocking. The, you get the frustration, but he just takes it too far. Oh, 100%. You know, um, poor Dale. I know. And it's like you feel, for, I mean, Adele is annoying. It, yeah. Like his, the sock thing where he's like whiffing the sock around yeah. and the airplane. Like, oh. The, in the bathroom, it's like you can, <laughs> like like that would drive me nuts. Yeah, too. 
and I might, I mean, you can see yourself in the characters. 100%. Like, I would probably get irate at him, too, if it's like, dude, we're staying at like, stop. Yeah. You are act like an adult, you know. And, right. Um, but he just takes it too far, and then, like, there's, I don't, there's just a relatability. Like, there's just really well-written characters mm-hmm. that aren't one-dimensional. Right, and I agree with that. That's what I say. Like, I think the acting, of course, is great. The The writing is good. It's not, it wasn't a lack of writing that didn't make me laugh out loud. I think it was just situational in the fact that, for some reason, I started feeling bad yeah. instead of finding it comical. I kind of just was like, I can't laugh at this person's misfortune at this point. Oh, it's no. just been so bad <laughs> well, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, there I were, I mean, now, don't get me wrong, there were some laugh out loud moments yeah. throughout the movie. And I think it was probably about halfway through the movie is when I started really enjoying it. Uh, and I think that's because we start finding out a little bit more about each character and stuff like that. And like yeah. you said, it's a great ending. You know, even though they have are going through something so terrible, like they still have like the nice little moment in the hotel, like when they're drinking their little their little uh, mini bar bottle. Yeah. Talking about home and it's just very tender. Yeah. And I just think that, that that's something that's really lacking in comedy. I mean, we were talking about it a while back where it's like, I mean, comedy films are dead. Yeah. Like they just don't make them right. really anymore. And when they do, I think you're right. I think you've said it before. It It's, it's just in your face comedy. There's no heart behind it. Yeah. They just and this feel, movie definitely has heart. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, it, it feels like there's a genuine human being writing it that right. has a, like had an experience or had his experiences and, and, he had a great ability to just, I mean, put a, to just speak a truth. Right. Even as preposterous as they could get, there's something to latch onto within the characters that you identify with and that feels genuine and authentic. Right. And, and they're just like, the movie's so, just so quotable. Yeah. There's so many lines. Like I know I was talking about the Dylan Baker part with the with the woman who's her babies came out sideways. She oh, didn't yeah. scream or nothing. She, you know? And when they try to sell the shower she's curtain, small right? but she's strong. She's small but she's strong. Yeah. And They're like, no, thank you. We'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, and they in the um, <laughs> the the cab, and he's like, I thought you guys would like to take the scenic route and see all the. Yeah. <laughs> it's just. And he's like, it's, it's night. It's midnight. <laughs> I don't know. Just a lot of little details that add a lot of character to the film. I was going to ask you if Neil's house was the Home Alone house. For some reason, it looked a lot like it to me. It does. Yeah. But then I saw here that it was built, a set built from scratch. (laughs) I mean, the interior was. Right. The exterior was definitely a house. Yeah. Well, it looks like the Home Alone house to me. I mean, it does. I don't think it is. But it's a very similar style house maybe he's just like that well i mean yeah i mean because he's wow. so he made the character he created the characters for and this is the thing like with his films or just comedies in general if you look at the earlier ones like 16, 16 candles or breakfast mm-hmm. uh, breakfast club which i love breakfast club yeah it's great <laughs> no what about you <laughs> uh, <laughs> smoke up johnny like those films are about middle America, middle like low like low income or like just like normal working class people, right. and you general you, you steadily start to see the increase. It just didn't, not just in his films, but in just comedies like it's especially comedies aimed at children. Yeah, like by the time you get to like Home Alone or even stuff, I don't know stuff like. Um, what was that movie? Blank Check. I was just and thinking that. For, I love what was Blank the one Check. with Sinbad where he's like the guarding the kid, the president's kid or something? Uh-huh. Anyway. Yeah. Those kind of ways, like the kids are just all rich and spoiled. Right. And they, like they learn how to be normal and it's like, yeah. oh, give me a break. I want characters that I can relate to. Right. But I mean, you start to see that like he's, well, but I mean, he is like an advertising yeah. guy. So he would be pretty well off. You right. Know, he would have a nice big house. And also, this is 1987. You could get a nice house for mm-hmm. not like right. a million dollars. 
And I don't think they super leaned into they him don't, being wealthy. By the time you get to Home Alone, it's like, okay, what does this dude do to pay right. for all these tickets? Exactly. <laughs> and <But> this house. <laughs> it's middle class America in the 90s, man. Like, it's a different time. It is. And you could. Like, things were affor- more affordable then. Right. Life was more affordable. Yeah. yeah. See that meme where, like, the lady's like, she's got a gar- uh, buggy full of food. It's like, this is what my $18 got me. <laughs> yeah. And I still got some change left over to go. To oh my gosh, I go to the store now and I get like four items and it's $25. Yeah. I go to the store now on. and it's four items and somehow it's 50 bucks. I don't yeah, understand it's how like that's how life works right now, but especially if you're trying to buy healthy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mean overall like I said, I think it's a good little movie. It's definitely one I could see popping in and for me like having in the background kind of thing. Definitely relatable. Which is important, I think, in comedy. And like I said, it does have heart. It, you know, you get to know the characters, and then even though they annoy each other so much, they have redeeming qualities that come out. Yeah, because we all do. We all have moments where we're like, we can be a holes. Oh, for sure. Only Mine's like 99.9% of the time. No. You said that. You said it. <laughs> uh, if, there's not, if there's one thing I am, I am very self aware. Mm-hmm. So you're also very nice most of the time. Meh. I mean, you say very professional. You say snarky things, but you're what? nice. <laughs> I don't think any of us here. I don't. I don't. I. That's a different. That's a different thing. You're cagey, yes, which yeah. you consider to be professional, but that's not what I mean. Oh. Okay. I mean, like you're actually nice. You just are a little bit sassy. Mm-hmm. We'll say sassy. Well, I think that's why we've called myself a diva in here many times. Yeah. You call yourself a... What is it? You call yourself that. He said, we've called myself. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, whatever. I think y'all y'all have definitely said it before. Uh-huh. Yeah. For sure. That's because it's true, start. but like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways. So, I was reading by Paul Hirsch, which I read his book. He's the mm-hmm. editor. The original cut was three hours and 40 minutes. Oh, wow. That's a, wow. That's, that's a rough cut, though. Yeah. Rough cuts are always, like, absurdly long because you're pretty much just throwing everything in. Right, so for any editing. They later put it down to two hours, and that's why they, they use that at that cut to to cut a lot of the trailers. So there's a lot of deleted scenes in the trailers. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So Hirsch says that there's still a two-hour cut of this movie. Hmm. There's All maybe right. an interpositive somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure if they released it, it would be interesting to watch. It, if nothing else, just as an ex, an exercise to see how important editing is, especially in a comedy. Mm-hmm. Comedies go on way too long anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true too. Ninety to like one hundred and five minutes. That's where you. That's the sweet spot for a comedy or a horror film too. Most horror films. I, yeah, I agree with that. Which I like it, short stuff. Because both of them can be. You can over be overbearing after a certain period yes, of time. Like you can only take so many laughs or so many no scares. scares. Yeah. Um, I think we could say that about most movies. I think most movies need a maximum well, of two hours to unfold. Like no, I mean stuff like something like Godfather or Lawrence Arabia. Yeah. Lord of the Ra- like big those movies. Are exceptions yeah. Yeah. yeah the I feel like those are exceptions. Like, I feel like, like the Green Mile. Room. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they some some stories need. I agree. Breathing but, room. But I think. Most, most of them like action, nowadays. Action, comedy, horror. Yeah. At I least under two hours. I don't know any movie that I've watched recently that's been along and I've been like, yes, it needed that three hours. I, I think most movies that are quote unquote genre films could do it in 90 minutes to two mm-hmm. hours with yeah, zero issue. For sure. And they need um, to go back and like start looking at older films to be like, wow, they do so much in just right. like okay. half the time of what. Because when they stretch them out like that, that, just trying to make like an epic movie, yeah, and that is definitely not an epic movie. You get all those slow parts, and it just really takes you out. Or you get and, a side plot you don't care about, and right? That you don't I need. I would like to go back. The movies are just not focused. They think more is more. Right. That's what I'm saying. Less is more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's nice to have just hey, this is what it is. Here's the 90 minutes of it. You know. Yeah. I agree with that for sure, and especially with comedies. Um. And like I said, just newer movies in general lately, I feel like they go on too long. Yeah, they do. Like, what the John Wick was almost three hours long. Oh my gosh, yeah. John Wick four. Yeah, I saw that. When the first to... the first one was ninety five minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Perfect. There's plenty of time. Um, then the last Indiana Jones was two and a half hours. Yeah, that I one. Wanted was... to leave. Oof. Oh my! I still am. Have, I got PTSD over that one. Yeah. 
I think uh, I fell asleep during both of those. Actually. I I wish I could have fallen asleep <laughs> and just uh, not remembered it. That's yeah. funny. Yeah, I feel like directors need to learn to kill their darlings a little bit. Yeah, you gotta. More yeah, like... you need to be more more savage with your right. material. Okay. And it's like it's especially harder when you're a writer and like you you wrote and directed it. Like, I can remember Kevin Smith talking about it. Like it's really hard to let go of some of this stuff. Yeah, and that makes sense because it's like it's kind of like your baby, but right. at the same time you gotta. It's it's like hard love. Well, to make think, the movie better, you have to cut some stuff. Exactly. And I think that comes into play what we were talking about one time on here about how you used to have these critics that would work hand in hand with the directors. Yeah, I mean they would give give, give like feedback like hey, this doesn't work. Yeah, you give like into in, intelligent feedback. Right. And I don't think criticism. we have that anymore. No, because most critics don't like they're like I think I talked about this but they're largely just they know the last 30 or 40 years of mainstream film and that's it. Right. Um, and that's, and that's sad. And I think you see that in the films. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a handful of really good films every year. Um, but they're getting fewer and far, farther between. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this year we had Barbie. At Bar- like this year's, this year's not bad. I got Barbie Oppenheimer. Mm. I, I mean, I think talk to me was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a lean little 90 minute. Hort, like it was yeah, that wasn't bad. Say it wasn't yeah. welcome, but and, and like there's this, like a movie can still be short and feel long. Like oh, exactly. Hebrew, Hebrew, you say like the, the the no good movie is ever long enough, and no short movie, no bad movie is ever short enough. Yeah, but like Truth or Dare, for instance, was like an hour forty five minutes, and like I said, I feel like it was three hours. It right. felt forever, <laughs> um, because it's just. Because of just the way it's edited and shot, like there's a, yeah. and it's like it's like subconscious, like a rhythm. Like you can get drawn into a film. Like Nolan's movies, especially, are really great at this. I remember going to see Batman Begins the day it opened, and the movie felt like it was over as soon as it began. Yeah, like it just drew me in, and like it was like I was there, and then it was just like it's over. I'm like, wow, I need to watch that again because I don't like it. Just washed washed over me in a right in a flash. Um, and that th- you know like. Like John Hughes had that ability to just be like, okay, we don't need this, cut it. We can streamline this. We can get more, a better rhythm for the material, for the comedy, and just cut cut the fat that you don't need. Right. And um, more people should look at a film like this and be like, that's how you make a comedy. Yeah, I think so. And that, that's the thing I was saying. Like, it's a cute little movie. It, it's just, it flows well. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, there's so much packed into it. But it's still, you get your, and I think this is what's missing or what's wrong with a lot of movies is a good movie like this, you get your introduction, you get the arc, which is the middle of the movie where everything happens, and then you get an ending. Yeah. That simple is what it needs to be. And like you said, we have so many side plots. Yeah, or they're trying to set up a sequel or a franchise. Right. So it's not just those three high points that need to be hit. Yeah. It's like, you know, you get an introduction and then you get to the arc, but then there's this side plot and this side plot and they got to wrap those back up to the ending and it just ends up more messy. And if we like this character, if this movie's a hit, we can make a TV show about them. Exactly. uh, Like, just make the Yeah, just make it. Make a good one and then it if there's room for a sequel, it's because it was good. Yeah. Right. And not we, just to make a sequel. We talked about, like, we talked about horror movies on here a lot. I just watched, because uh, we're we're f- recording this in October still, and it's my month of only horror movies all the time, um, which is most of my life, but in this month particularly. And I, like, I have an issue with, like, modern horror is always trying to set up that sequel. Right, yeah. Like, they're always doing, you know, the ending jump scare or the, Mm -hmm. like, little, you know, the the little little bit of, like, oh, maybe they're not really dead. And it's, like, let it just... Let, let it be what it, it is. Be, right. Like your low budget horror movie was fine, but now you've went and cheapened the ending by having like mm-hmm. this little extra drama come in at the end, and it's like this. This was okay, right? And you, it could just be okay, and it like you're not going to. You have not created the next Jason Voorhees. Like we, you're not going to. Like doing people are ten. not. They've tried. Like you tried to like recreate this kind of like sensation of, of like. Mm-hmm. A character that you can make a series out of right and, and like they really don't the closest you get is stuff like 
the Conjuring movies or Insidious. Yeah. Right. But it's not. That's more. It's. It's. There's not like a central villain draw. Like central they don't really make villain. monster movies like that anymore. Like right. those are like the eighties and eighties version of the Universal monsters. You know. Well, and no one wants to watch those. It and like those people want to watch those. because yeah. They have like fond memories and they like. But like. We're not really looking for a new one. Those are no. like kind of like and not in the. They're really well made. They're but they are campy. Like yeah, and, and they and, and they. But they know that, and that's what they want to be. And I think that that is like you can't recreate that. No, now. it's really hard to do that. Everything's got to be ironic and self-referential mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah, which is why I like Talk to Me so much because it wasn't like a, it wasn't trying to make a sequel. It wasn't right. trying to set anything up. It was a clear A, B, and C story. Mm-hmm. There is, if you wanted, if I think they will, if they do want to do a sequel. To. There is within that. You know, World. reality That's they've fine. created. Yeah. yeah, there is something they could do, which oh, I think 100%. they will. But it uh, wasn't it. But the but thing about it was, is it wasn't like a sad plot. It wasn't the movie to was try very, to set it up. It's very focused on their ordeal. Yeah, with the. That you know, one with the the possession, like, right? And all that, you and, know? and that's the thing with that. It's literally one line in that movie that sets it up for a sequel if they want to. It's yeah. that there's another hand out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's, all, that's yeah. all it took. That's it. Just that yeah. one line that makes sense on. to the rest of the movie. Yeah. yeah. And hey, it did well. Now they can make a second if they want. Yeah. It it doesn't always have to be this big extra part of a movie and i love it when it falls on their face yeah like they tried to set up this um dark universe at universal Mm -hmm. with like the universal monsters and the first one was the tom cruise mummy movie which i fell asleep during yeah Uh, but they have this whole like the movie just stops dead in its tracks not that it was good to begin with but it just stops even further dead in its tracks with this long exposition scene with russell crowe who's playing dr jekyll and mr hyde i think yeah i remember and trying to set up like his movie Frankenstein and all this oh. other stuff, and they've like done this huge cast. Like Johnny Depp was going to be Miss the Invisible Man, mm-hmm. Angelina Jolie was going to be the Bride Frankenstein. Uh, I think Javier Bardem was going to be Frankenstein. Like it was just like make a good movie first, right? You can't like even the Marvel movies. Like they just made they made Iron Man. Nobody really remembers the Incredible Hulk for a good reason, but they made Iron Man and yeah. they made. That had a pretty good movie. Right. People were like, okay, people like this. It made money. Now right, we can go Marvel. get going. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you just have to make a good movie first. Yeah. Like, well, it, also, like... It just never really works out the other way. The 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 cultural phenomenon that was the Mummy movie... You mean featured, the Brendan Fraser? Yeah, the Brendan Fraser movie. Like, just, it's going to be hard to, like, um, kind of hit... That I think, like any no, I mean, name, the mummy is going to get repaired compared to that, and that is, or I mean, the original too. A like, great, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and I think like they were they were more going for that, like original. Well, feel. I mean, the whole, I mean, that one in particular was just very f- flavorless and bland, like yeah. just generic. Like it's like it's Mission Impossible, but there's a mummy. Yeah, that's it's weird. a weird way to start a French like, like even the Brendan Fraser one. Like you feel like it's. Like that's coming from somewhere within Stephen Summers because he has a very goofy sensibility and sense of humor, and you feel that watching the movie. It's like he right. loves the setting, he loves these characters, he loves just the tone of like this kind of Indiana Jones, this mm-hmm. you know vibe. Yeah, it's just this wild film. You know, yeah. you'd have a giant sandstorm mummy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, sure, it's cool, and you just go with it because it's fun. Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz are great, and you know, there's color and there's humor. Uh, it's just nothing about the, the like there's it's it's coming from a a corporate checklist right not, mm-hmm. not from somewhere that's like I really want to make this movie yeah and I think that's what we see a lot yeah that's what that's I mean and, that's I don't know it's just I just it's hard watching a lot of new movies it's like the yeah. Exorcist one that I, that I just saw I think you have to have real passion it's, for the for the project uh, to be yeah. able to have successfully launch and like trying to. Cre- I think setting out to try to create a franchise just doesn't work. Right. Yeah, and it's like this exorcist thing. Like, So Universal bought the rights mm-hmm. to make a trilogy for $400 million mm-hmm. is what they paid for. And they're like, well, we'll get the guy that made the last three Halloween movies to do it. Hmm. That's a choice. Um, 
and that's not a good choice. Because <laughs> it's like, I, I mean, I feel like you watched the Halloween 2018, and you're yeah. like, okay, this guy really like loves Halloween. And then it kind gets of it. falls apart. As I mean, it, it does goes. fall apart eventually. Yeah. yeah. But I liked them all, but I, I, I even like them. even ends like I've watched it again and I enjoy it a little yeah. bit more. But it's still it's like it's not how I would have. Right, right. I don't think it's the. I don't. Still don't think it's a good ending for the. Uh, for the yeah, the 2018 was the best one. 2018 is the best one, yeah, easily. But it's like you watch it, and so you feel like, okay, they got Carpenter to do the score. They really feel like they. This feels like a logical conclusion. Forty years mm-hmm. later, for Laurie, and just the little things like Michael is not like Michael's not coming for her. They cut out the whole sister subplot, which mm-hmm. I just loved. Yeah, that they mm-hmm. got rid of yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. Yes, and it's just like Laurie's going after him. Mm-hmm. Or he's hunting him. And it's like, there's a nice reversal and it feels organic. And it's like, the exorcist feels like, all right, what's <laughs> great idea. There was one, one little girl get, got possessed in the first one. We'll do two. Yeah. Genius. Yeah. That's how I feel it was in the, in the boardroom on that one. <laughs> it's like, y'all are idiots. <laughs> and then you made this dumb, awful movie. That just is dumb, dumb, dumb. Yeah. I thought it was fun, but not, it definitely, and I've not even seen the first Exorcist all the way, but it yeah. definitely didn't deserve to be called Exorcist. So the Exorcist no. is a trilogy. That didn't need to be a trilogy. Yeah, they've set it up for a trilogy. Like, yeah. they're, I mean, I don't think they're going to make I mean, the it. The original, what, like, didn't need sequels and does have sequels. I don't, yeah. yeah like, and like, just, barring the third one, yeah. which William Peter Blatty, which is really, it's a really good movie. Like, if you yeah. watch the first one, just watch the third one after. It's really good. Yeah, the middle bit. Because the second <laughs> the second one has, I think, I think it's James Earl Jones writing a giant locust. Yeah, why? Well, yeah. It's oh, trippy, okay. and it's weird. <laughs> and it's just like, what? You hire, like, Oscar-winning actors in that movie. Um, like, Louis Fletcher coming off of One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. And then you had these other ones. Anyway, this is not the Exorcist podcast, but I'm just saying, like, just make a good movie. Yeah. What happens will happen. Right. And like with this new extra, just like they've supposedly have a whole trilogy planned. Right. Which I'm sure is about as well planned as the Halloween trilogy. That's the point is the Halloween trilogy. I feel like it just didn't know where it was going. It after didn't. the first one. It and I feel like at, at the end of the day, like I liked kills and I've learned to accept ends. <laughs> I, yeah. but, ends is but the I, one I struggle with. Yeah. I, I could just like, I could just do Halloween and Halloween. Like yeah. the 78 and 18. Mm-hmm. And like the 18 a perfect little mirror. Right. Of the original. Michael, you don't know where he is. You can't kill the boogeyman. Yeah. I don't need, I don't need to see him get killed. Right. I don't want him to get killed because he's the boogeyman. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, so anyway. Yeah. Anyway, back but, to planes, trains, and autos. Yeah, this is a we Thanksgiving get like episode. four to six minutes. Yeah, and... sorry, <laughs> but but uh, I mean, but that that's was, what we're saying. Alternate is... ending to planes and trains. Michael Myers just shows up and stabs Dale in the back, oh <laughs> and then slaughters God. the family. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, that could have been good. Um, uh, but that, that's what we're saying. Is planes, trains, and automobiles does it correctly? Where it's just a short movie packed with a lot of things. That yeah. help the movie move along and make sense, and it's not all these side plots and all these setting up for a sequel and all of that. Because this is a movie that doesn't need anything like that. But also because it's just well done. It's a movie. It's good. Yeah, it's and that's just, the end of it. I mean, that's how it used to be. They just make a good movie, right? And that that's how I felt about this. Is like the same kind of movie around that time. Other John Candy movies, Steve yeah. Martin movies, good movies that just. Everything's packed in, and it's yeah. a good movie. Yeah, you don't and, need Home and Alone that's it. Two. You didn't barely need Home Alone one. Yeah, I did like Home Alone one. I mean, Home Alone one's fine. I yeah. think one and two are fine. I think after that, it just well, yeah. Well, it's like really like he's. It's just such a like. Oh, now he's. It's the same thing as like the two girls and the extras. Like, yeah, he was stuck in this little like his, like in his house for the most part in the first film. Right. Now he's in New it's York. Like, now he's in New York. It's bigger. It's yeah. Like, okay. Same movie. I don't think it's a yeah. I don't think it's a bad movie, but it is. It's that thing where you're just taking a movie just because it did well, and you're like, well, how do we make it bigger? Mm-hmm. But anyway, planes, trains, and automobiles. So I'm guessing nobody in your family watched this. This is not a tradition. Yeah, not that I know. Of. Okay. I mean, I guess not, since I don't know of it. I guess. I mean, that's why I'm assuming. I'm just making sure. No, remember we your, fight. Your family like, was just like, hey, let's watch our planes, trains, and automobiles. It's Thanksgiving, and you're yeah, just like, no, 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 no I'm not gonna. Watch no, that. I won't do that. Why you suddenly got a British accent? No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it does happen sometimes. 
<laughs> but yeah, no, it wasn't. Uh, like I said, I think we were too busy being the family out of August Osage County. Wow. Sounds like fun. So, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I guess that'll wrap up our uh, Thanksgiving episode. Yeah. So, yeah, this is our Thanksgiving episode. Like Toby said, we're kind of recording it in October because Toby's getting married. Woo! And it needs to be off to do so. <laughs> so, we'll yeah. be back recording again About at the month. end of November. Yeah. For our next episode, which is going to be, we'll be heading into Christmas. December, December, the holidays again. And Aaron, no, I was looking. Aaron just checked my, his watch. No, somebody was calling me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he was checking his watch for like, uh, yeah, December. <laughs> What's that? December. No, but we will be going into December. So we're going to do another, uh, we'll probably do holiday movies throughout the month of December. Yeah. Or for both of our episodes. And... We're going to start with holiday horror, I guess, yeah. because I, why not? We love horror. Yeah, we promise the, the, the December 15th one will not be horror movies. Yeah, December 15th will be not, not, not horror. horror movies. It'll be some kind of holiday for sure. Uh, but we are going to start with, with holiday horror, and you were going to pick... I was going to pick the 74 Black Christmas. Yes. And I've seen the 2006 Black Christmas, which or Black Xmas. I don't know how you say it on there, but that's the one I I liked at one point. And but then there's another one, yeah, that they made in 2019. That is supposedly like it goes the original, the 2019, and then the 2006 one. Supposedly, like in supposedly. the in the ranking, that's usually yes. how it goes. So we've decided we're just going to watch all three. Yeah, we're gonna do all three. It's a giant, yeah, black, black Christmas, black Christmas episode, which I haven't. I've only seen the original, and I've only seen the two thousand six. So it'll be fun. I mean, it'll be fun to be to analyze two remakes of the yeah, same I film. Yeah, I think so. See what each one, because I mean, there's a far what enough. They did take there's definitely like a big enough gap between the seventy four and the two thousand six mm -hmm. to see like, okay, it's two thousand six. What is what is the state of horror? Right. And you can, you know, there's 13 years later, you can say, okay, where's horror at now? Yeah, I think they're spaced so you, out pretty well yeah, for us to... I just wish they'd made one in the 80s and 90s, then we would have five movies in each room. <laughs> we could analyze what... Horror, all, horror at all horror decades, yeah. basically. It's, it's kind of fun to do that. Yeah. To like, see something that's... I mean, you could kind of do that with the extras to a certain degree. Right. I guess, yeah. But, yeah. I don't know. I think it'll be a fun episode. I think so, too. I think it's going to be interesting. We... So both of us have not seen two of them. They're yeah. just two different ones. Yeah. So that that's kind of cool. And well, the 2019, we'll both be watching for the first that'll time. That'll be fresh for both of us. So yeah. that'll be kind of cool. And and like you said, being able to compare them throughout the years and how horror has changed will be pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, it'll be a fun episode. Yeah. So join us for that. That episode will be our December 1st episode. Mm -hmm. So you have plenty of time. Well... No, you won't have as much time as we do. So, <laughs> but you have time to watch all three of those, I'm sure. So, watch all three of those and join us as we discuss Black Christmas. Sizz. Sizz. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's going to be a good time. I think so. So, yeah, join us for our Black Christmas episode. It's also the first episode where we're going to review three movies. I think so. Yeah, yeah I th I'm pretty sure. So join us for our Black Christmas episode. But until then, I'm Aaron. I'm Josh. And this has been The Real Opposites.